All right. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Jesse Steif, and I'm the president of the Reading League Florida. We are super excited to bring you uh, tonight's webinar, Teaching Vocabulary is Complex, Techniques and Decisions, with the wonderful Linda Diamond. Uh, I have just a couple of quick announcements here before we get into the content of tonight's webinar. I want to encourage everyone to keep up with the Reading League Florida on our various websites. The main way that we communicate with folks is through social media, and you can find us on Facebook at the Reading League Florida. We're always putting out high quality resources that are directly applicable for teachers and other stakeholders. So if you're so inclined, go ahead and, and follow us on Facebook. You can also find us at fl.thereadingleague.org. Uh, while you're on our pages, I'll encourage everyone to consider joining us um, as members or making a donation. Uh, your membership helps us kind of keep the lights on, as it were, and keep the free, high-quality PD coming. We are an all-volunteer 501c3 organization, and so uh, the Reading League Florida is only a labor of love that we do for free. And every penny from, uh, from membership and donations goes right back into the organization. Our aim is to keep all of our content free and publicly available since we never want money to be a barrier for professional development. Uh, I also wanna thank our friends and mission partners at the Center for Collaborative Classroom. Collaborative Classroom is a mission-driven nonprofit organization committed to ensuring that all kids become readers, writers, and thinkers um, who learn from, who care for, and respect one another. They are the publishers of several high quality curricula, including SIPs, uh, being a reader, being a writer, and making meaning. They're also always putting out high quality professional development in the form of webinars, online academy courses, uh, and blog posts, including some truly excellent ones authored by tonight's speaker, uh, among many others. And you can find them at collaborativeclassroom.org. All right, and uh, lastly, it is my pleasure to introduce Linda Diamond. Uh, Linda is the founder and former president of Consortium on Reading Excellence in Education, or CORE. Uh, a, and CORE is a professional learning organization that serves districts and schools and state agencies to improve literacy and math achievement for all students. She's the author of three very widely used professional books for educators, including uh, Teaching Reading Sourcebook, which should be in every educator's professional library, um, Assessing Reading Multiple Measures, and the Vocabulary Handbook. Uh, she's been a K-12 district administrator, a middle school and elementary principal, a high school teacher, and a senior policy analyst uh, in an educational think tank. Uh, she's now retired and spends her retirement time sharing her expertise and speaking to groups uh, across the country. So thank you so much, Linda, and please go ahead and take it away. Thank you, Jesse. Thank you for the introduction. <clears throat> so I thought about uh, today, originally my title was going to be Teaching Complex Vocabulary is Complex. And then I realized teaching vocabulary period is complex, whether it's complex vocabulary or not. So um, I changed the title because we do see that figuring out what vocabulary to teach starts us down the road of complexity. And then how best to teach that vocabulary is a secondary level of complexity. So today, these are the objectives that I have for this session tonight. One is just understanding vocabulary and instruction. A second is in particular addressing the needs of multilingual learners, which are very critical and involve oral language and academic language. We're gonna look at two experts who don't quite agree about how best to teach vocabulary in the context of reading complex text. 
we'll actually see two video models that exemplify those differing perspectives on how best to handle vocabulary with complex text. Then, and this is in your handout, and I believe uh, you were sent the handout in advance, but Jesse is also putting it in the chat. You have a flow chart and a graphic organizer to help plan vocabulary instruction, in particular, if you wanna plan vocabulary when you're doing close reading or reading complex text with students. And you're going to have a chance to think about the flow chart and an organizer and apply it to a small portion of text that we're all going to look at. So let's start with a definition. Wh what is academic vocabulary? And it's important to understand who is responsible for ensuring that students develop academic vocabulary. So I'm just gonna read through this in case any of you are having difficulty with uh, seeing it on the screen. But it's particular to understand that academic vocabulary is not unique to a particular discipline, which means it's not the clear responsibility of a particular content area teacher. In fact, academic vocabulary requires all hands on deck. I was working with an elementary school recently, and even their art and PE teachers were taking a share of uh, providing instruction in some of the tier two words that as a school, they had all agreed would be important to teach. And in fact, these tier two words, and I'm alluding to the terminology that Dr. Isabel Beck and her colleagues used in bringing words to life, and it's the same terminology the Common Core uses, are less well-defined than um, perhaps tier three words. Tier three words are often defined in the text. Tier three words are those more disciplined specific words. And yet, these tier two words are frequently encountered in complex written text and are particularly powerful because of their wide applicability to many sorts of reading. So teachers need to be alert to the presence of tier two words and determine which ones need careful attention. Now I will say that more and more textbook publishers are helping us with this particularly many of the texts that Ed Reports evaluated uh, with um, as being very effective with their strongest ratings, do a pretty good job of vocabulary instruction. But usually it's not enough. In particular, one issue stands out that textbooks have not yet figured out how to do. And that is the research that indicates we have to develop multiple exposures. And textbooks will do a good job of teaching. They'll do a good job of having students process the words, but they are less likely to have a sufficient amount of multiple exposures. And that's important. So why are academic words important? Well, they're critical to understand most texts and in particular, more complex texts and texts across disciplines. They appear in many kinds of texts and they require deliberate effort. Unlike tier one words, tier one words, often once a child decodes the word, they recognize its meaning from their oral language. However, a caveat is this may be more of a challenge for our multilingual learners, where even some of the tier one words are not recognizable in their oral language. So we have to be mindful about that. They appear much more often 
in written text than in speech. In fact, studies were done showing that even comic books and cartoons, uh, graphic cartoons have more complex text, more academic words and academic vocabulary than speech. They also often represent subtle or precise ways to explain something that might otherwise be simple and they are rarely scaffolded. Tim Shanahan points out that teaching vocabulary is absolutely critical for comprehension. And in fact, he asserts that pre-teaching vocabulary before reading a complex text is vital and it's not the same as previewing text or building background knowledge. It's another skill that needs to be developed. And I'll be sharing later, he's one of the experts. And then we have a second one, Alfreda Hebert, who approaches it differently. So what are the components of effective vocabulary instruction? Well, first there are kind of three big ideas. There's incidental vocabulary learning. This happens in our oral language experiences in the classroom. It happens in wide reading and teacher read alouds and independent reading. And then there's this idea of word consciousness, which I'm actually not gonna be able to get to today, but word consciousness is where we play with language. We allow our students to relish words, and they do. And this could include teaching origins, histories about words, playing with words, puns, idiomatic expressions. And then there's, and this is where we're going to center the conversation, intentional vocabulary teaching. And there are two categories, specific word instruction, and this involves in particular uh, what Isabel Beck talks about and putting the words, using them, including words as we're reading text, but also teaching sets of words directly. And then there's the word learning strategies, which are absolutely crucial to teach because these are the strategies students will need to become independent at figuring out vocabulary while they're reading. Dictionary use, there are appropriate ways to use dictionaries. I'm not gonna be speaking about that today either. However, in um, two of my books that Jesse alluded to, the Teaching Reading Source Book um, and Vocabulary Handbook, we do have a chapter on how to use a dictionary effectively and when to. But morphemic analysis is absolutely critical. And that means we have to teach our students how to use affixes, prefixes, suffixes, and roots in order to be able to uncover the meaning of unfamiliar words. And then contextual analysis, not for the purpose of decoding, but for the purpose of helping students figure out an unfamiliar word's meaning in text and confirm a word that they decoded to make sure it makes sense in the context of the text. And then for our multilingual learners, we also wanna be aware of cognates, those Latinate bases that may cross languages and cause words to have the same cognate, particularly in Spanish and in English. We'll see this in other languages that share a Latin origin. So, uh, and with regard to contextual analysis, one of the things that, and I'm not gonna go into depth on this, is teaching students how to use and recognize signal words that can tell them a text is going to have a contextually based explanation of a word. For example, 
if we see a word that we think students might know, but it's followed by something like, like, as, also, we're expecting to see some kind of synonym embedded in the text. Or we might see or as a signal word after a word that's more complex, followed by an appositive, a phrase encompassed by two commas, which typically means it's another way of explaining that word. So teaching students ways to unlock contextual analysis is very important. There are uh, Nancy Hennessy's book, um, which I know you guys have had some words, you're doing some reading around the uh, Reading Comprehension Blueprint, does address morphemic analysis and contextual analysis, and also Teaching Reading Source Book and Vocabulary Handbook uh, provide ways to do this. Many of the newly published textbooks that had good ratings do this as well. Okay, it's also important to understand that in vocabulary, there are different vocabulary forms. And in fact, the best vocabulary instruction requires students to not only read vocabulary, but also to write vocabulary and speak using the vocabulary words and listen so that we have to make use of all of these forms in order to cement the meaning. Now, I'm sure many of you understand this concept of the three tiers of words, which Dr. Beck and her colleagues really popularized. So first we have those tier one words, which typically are very basic words, often concrete, often encountered in oral language and conversation, and most students will know them at a particular grade. But again, we have to be aware of our multilingual learners. Tier two tend to be more abstract. They're those general academic words that cross content. They're encountered most often in written language, but they have high utility because you're going to see them in texts that cross content areas. Kids will see them in informational texts. They'll see them in literary texts. They'll see them in science-oriented texts. And these are words like very, relative, innovation, accumulate, surface, layer. And then we have those specialized, discipline-specific terms that have to be taught, but they are very particular to the subject matter at hand. And they have low occurrences in texts outside of that discipline, and they have to be taught nonetheless. And many of those words in discipline-based texts, and I'm thinking of a history text, maybe a science, will often be bolded and there may be a glossary explaining them, but they will have to be explained and taught, but they don't have the generative value that tier two words do. So what do we know about specific word instruction? Well, first of all, we have to be highly selective about which words to teach. We are not going to give students 10 words on Monday, have them look them up in the dictionary, and then have a test on them on Friday and expect that those words have any meaning. So the selection of words is really why we're valuing these well-designed textbooks, because it is very difficult to determine what words to teach. But there are some clues that we're gonna go through. We also have to provide rich knowledge of word meanings, not just the definition. And this is where the idea of a student-friendly explanation comes in. 
Uh, having kids look up words in a dictionary is just a recipe for disaster because a dictionary often has in its definition other rare words that the kids might not know. And it doesn't help that much, although there are some dictionaries that are better than others. In addition, we've got to make sure that kids have multiple encounters with targeted words, and then we need to engage them with those words, use them in different contexts, create associations so that they're not just having a one-time experience learning about these words. But in addition to specific teaching of specific words, we have to teach those techniques that build independent learning when students encounter novel words. The teacher is not always going to be there to explain the vocabulary. Dictionaries might not be at hand. Kids may not always have their iPads or some source, and we need to teach them how to figure out vocabulary words. And the way we do this is by teaching them the use of morphemes. And that includes those most useful high utility prefixes and suffixes that appear often. We do have to teach the meaning of those. And there are also high utility lists of roots that are extremely useful. Um, again, for a list of these, the vocabulary handbook and the teaching reading source book both have it. I'm not trying to promote my books, but they have these resources in them. You also have to teach when context is useful and when it's not. Some contexts can be very misdirective. And if we have students who are still struggling with decoding, what that often means is there simply isn't enough context to use context because too many words cannot be decoded. This is why we have to make sure that our students become automatic at word recognition so that all words can become sight words. So when they are reading, they freed their working memory to focus on meaning making. And that includes understanding vocabulary. We want to teach kids how and when to use a dictionary, and we want to engage them in word consciousness activities. Now I'm going to show you a video that models a way that a teacher capitalizes on morphemic analysis instruction. This happens to be a sixth grade class. The bulk of the students are English learners in this particular class, they already have been taught the meaning of a prefix and a suffix. And you'll see how the teacher makes use of that knowledge with these students. We're gonna talk about a word that we didn't just discuss, which is imperishable. And in this word, we can see a root word in the middle, and the root is perish, perish. And then what other word parts do you see? What other word parts? We've been talking about word parts. So, Jonathan, what do you see? Im. Im, and what is that? What do we call that? A prefix. A prefix. And what does the prefix im mean? Not. Not. Okay, im means not. And is there another word part that you see here? Okay, we've got a prefix, we've got a root, and what else do we have? Daisy. Able. Able, and what do we call that word part? Suffix. A suffix, excellent. And do you remember what able means it something can, it can do something usually? So we have the word perish in the middle. To perish means to be destroyed or to die. Perish means to be destroyed or to die. So if you said, oh, I was so hungry, I thought I would perish from hunger, 
That means I thought I would die from hunger. That's the way you might use the word perish. But if we have perish means to die or to be destroyed, and we have im, that means that it is not going to be capable of dying, something that cannot die or be destroyed. Okay, so we have perish means it can die or be destroyed. Able means it can be. So if something is perishable, fruit is perishable. And many people call fruit and vegetables perishables. That's in the grocery store. They call that section the perishables, meaning they can die. They have a, a limited life. The other part of the grocery store is filled with cans and boxes of things that are not as perishable. Maybe eventually, after many years, they're no good, but they don't die the way fruit does. So we have perishables, and then if something is not perishable, it's imperishable. Okay, that particular word is in a text that um, the students will be reading, or it could be taught after the students have read the text. This is a choice, and it happens to be the text that's in your handout as well. So what else do we know that we have to do for our multilingual learners? Well, first of all, we have to understand that the type of vocabulary instruction that benefits native English speakers also benefits multilingual learners. But there are other strategies that we have to be mindful of. First is taking advantage of the first language. We can build on what our students already bring to us and utilize that when we're helping them learn English academic vocabulary. We may have to teach the meanings of basic words and we are likely to need to provide much more review and reinforcement, including a lot of oral language and discussion and talk around these words. There are some guidance for what we should consider for our English language learners, our multilingual learners. And there are some modifications to that three-tier method that we might want to think about. First of all, we want to consider, is the vocabulary word concrete or abstract? Because if it's concrete, we can show an image or a picture. And we could also have students say what that is in their own language. Could it be demonstrated? If it's concrete, it's more likely to be able to be demonstrated, although abstract terms can be demonstrated as well. For example, veiled will be able to show a picture, an image, of something that is covered over or veiled, but reliable is a bit more abstract. So we would have to think more about how we would connect that, how we would teach it. Then we also have to think about depth of meaning. And this is particularly true for multiple meaning words. So a word like party, for example, most students are going to understand what party is when they think about going to a party, but they might not understand the usage when thinking about a political party, for example, which is not necessarily the same as a party that you attend for a birthday or some friend's party. And they certainly wouldn't understand the context of the Donner party, for example. So this is an example of words that we need to really pay attention to, particularly for our multilingual learners. And then you have a word like sheer, which could describe a type of fabric, but could also involve shearing something off or cutting it off or a sheer cliff. And we have to be careful about those kinds of words. And then we have the word that can be produced, pronounced 
two ways. Produce, that's those perishables that was just described in the grocery store, or produce, produce, produce something, produce or produce. So we have to be very careful with these terms. But we also have to always ask, is the meaning of the word critical to understanding the particular text that we want to teach for these students? What are the other supports that we need to use? Well, first of all, we need to build on our students' experiences and familiar content. And this is where it's important to be mindful of culturally responsive instruction. We have to provide background, any background knowledge that's necessary. Graphic organizers are very useful for all students, but in particular for helping our multilingual learners to clarify concepts. We have to make sure our instruction and learning tasks are clear. We can use realia, pictures and demonstrations, interactive hands-on, and we're often going to want to be a bit redundant. In fact, recent research has shown that the use of gestures and visual cues can be very helpful in teaching a vocabulary word. So these are some things to consider. We'll wanna consider additional time, additional practice, and the use of sentence frames to help situate the word, the vocabulary words in context and within a syntactic structure. And then we wanna utilize first language knowledge that the students bring to us. So these are four strategies that really need to be in every teacher's repertoire. Showing images. And of course, this works best for concrete words, nouns, sometimes adjectives or verbs, you're gonna see examples. They can be displayed on whiteboards and they can be reviewed over the course of a week. Demonstrations, that's another technique and strategy that everyone needs, particularly useful for action verbs, also can be useful for adjectives. The idea of quickly defining at point of use during a read aloud, for example, uh, we can define some of these words as we're reading them. These are typically those low incidence words, but they're still important to understand the text. And it's for those words that are much above a student's grade level. And then we have to know how to fully and explicitly teach those very important tier two words. It is the most time consuming. So we wanna focus that on those high utility words that go across content areas. And usually these words are a bit more abstract. So we're gonna start with the idea of displaying images. Again, concrete words, nouns. You can use Google Images or other search engines for some quick results. Don't do this on the spot. This is preparation that the teacher needs to do in advance of the lesson. So you have all your images lined up. And this is an example from an often read third grade text, Ramona Quimby. These are some of the words that will not necessarily be familiar to our students. You'll notice many of them are nouns, but a couple of them are not nouns, or three of them are not nouns. And so we're going to take a look at some of the ways that we could display these quickly in order to explain them. Well, first of all, I would bet that many of our kids have never even seen a cash register of the old fashioned kind. Um, and so explaining what a cash register is 
And then explaining the word register would be a quick explanation, but the use of a visual image will help these students. You'll notice there's a little more sophisticated one, but I bet most of our kids are used to just inserting a credit card or they're now seeing their parents uh, go on to Square or some other technological source that a merchant is using. Here's another one, warehouse. This one's interesting because a lot of students will not understand what where is. They'll understand house, but they might not know what a where is. So we have to explain what a where is. It's merchandise. It's things that we buy. It's items that might be stored in a house that's called a warehouse. And here are examples. One of these is Amazon. And I think a lot of students will understand the concept that a lot of items get stored in these warehouses before they're sold or brought out to the public. Showing multiple images of a word is very important. Here's one. I'm certain our students have seen these in action, but they might not know that it's called a forklift, yet that's a term in the Ramona Quimby book. And you can show them that it's a, it's a, a motorized vehicle that's going to lift up heavy objects. And you'll notice those two parts sticking out at the very bottom, they look like a fork like a fork that you eat with. But in this case, it's a fork on which you put the heavy items. So here's a way to explain forklift. Here's my favorite one from the book, Bigfoot. And in this case, we explain that this is a creature, some sort of wild something that some people believe exists and many believe do not exist. And we have all kinds of drawings of what this creature would exist. But notice the size of the feet, big foot. And that's how we get that name. Now, here's an example of an, an adjective. We can help with images of adjectives. The word is scarce. This is a picture of a city in Italy. The city in Italy is Naples. And you could see in this picture that it's really, really crowded. There's hardly any open space. So open space is scarce. That means it's limited. It's hard to find. It's rare. In fact, Naples is Europe's most crowded city. There are very few parks or open spaces. So open space is scarce in this city. And unfortunately today, we have another very sad example. In the news, we've been hearing a lot about baby formula how baby formula is scarce, which means it's hard to find. There isn't enough. Here's an adjective. And this will require some explanation because you could think by the one image of the young boy that it's anger, but it's frustrated. It's when you've been working so hard to figure something out or to try to do something and it's just not working and you get so frustrated, you almost wanna give up because you've been trying so hard. Now this would be where I also ask my students to show me their frustrated face and they, and they do that, they pick it up pretty quickly. And that leads into demonstrations. So we can also quickly demonstrate, particularly for verbs. 
In fact, I'd like you to think about for a moment how you would demonstrate any of these words that are in the book Frindle. Now, obviously I can't see your faces, but as a teacher, I would show them, for example, pursing my lips or uh, squinting, which I actually do a lot, especially if I'm not wearing my special computer glasses. But these are things that you can demonstrate and then you can ask students to demonstrate in turn. Now, there's also explicit instruction. Again, that is important in your repertoire. The first thing we need to do is pronounce the word and have students pronounce the words. And the reason we need to do that is cement the speech to print idea. We want them to match the phonemes to the graphemes and hear the word in their language and break it into syllables if it's a multi-syllabic word. Then we're providing a student-friendly explanation. Then we're going to likely have to provide a translation or, for example, if I have Spanish-speaking students, a cognate, if it's applicable. I usually call on my students who are native speakers of the language to do the heavy lifting of making the pronunciation. Uh, include related word forms, word families, or antonyms, for example, and then provide multiple examples using the words in different contexts beside the context of the text that they're going to read. And I can provide an image, and, but I very importantly need to engage the students to process the word meaning. It can't be me, the teacher, doing all the work. And I'm going to use prompts to help students develop written and oral discussion using sentence frames. And I'm going to provide follow-up questions. Here's an example, again, of images, but now I have a word that can be a verb or a noun. And in Spanish, the verb breed is criar or criarse. And then I have to explain that people breed all kinds of animals and plants. Now I'm going to have to explain what breeding means. And I have to do this in such a way that it doesn't become a, um, a sexual 101 lesson. <laughs> <laughs> which is difficult with the idea of breeding. But I would explain to students that to breed involves taking a male and a female of an animal and having them meet and get together in order to produce a child or an offspring. And that breeders of animals bring together males and females in order to develop more dogs, more cats. And in this case, it's breeding horses. And you'll see that there are different breeds. So while a breeder is the person who does this, who does the work of producing these animals and raising these animals, they breed them by selecting the appropriate male and female. But then we end up with different breeds or different types. And here you see three different types of horses. Here are different dog breeds. And I would ask my students, how many of these can they recognize? How many have they seen? But these are what resulted from a breeder breeding male and female dogs, in this case, of the same breed. But some breeders breed together two different dogs. For example, I have a good friend who has 
a cockapoo, which is a combination of a cocker spaniel, see that picture in the bottom, and a poodle. You don't see a poodle here, but they bred a male cocker spaniel with a female poodle and they got a cockapoo. These are different breeds. And then I might complete this by asking for a written response because I want to engage the students. The question I'm going to ask is what is your favorite breed of dog? And then my favorite breed of dog is the blank because blank. So now I've given them a sentence frame to work with. I want them to write this down or I'm going to have them with a partner complete the sentence frame and then share it. And my example might be my favorite breed of dog is the Husky because they are so intelligent and so strong that they can pull sleds across Alaska. And I'd like you to take a minute and in the chat, I'd like some of you or all of you to write your favorite breed of dog. You don't have to do the sentence frame, just share some of your favorite dog breeds. And then Jesse, can you tell me some of the breeds that you're seeing? They are coming fast and furious. We have Havanese, we have Pit Bulls, Dachshunds, St. Bernards, Boston Terriers, Golden Retrievers. Lots of Golden Retrievers. Oh, yep. I think Golden Retriever might be our, might be our number one. That's answer. our number one. Yep. So I'm a Doberman fan. I know that just like Pit Bulls, Dobermans and Pit Bulls get a bad rap but they're actually amazing dogs. Now I'm gonna show you an example of a sentence frame using the word situated in a class. And again, this is going to be a word that appears in the text that you're gonna see and that we're gonna look at later. The next word is situated and you're going to finish the sentences on your paper and then you're going to share with your partner. So the first sentence is a place I would love to be situated is blank because blank. So I'd like you to say that with me. A place, everybody, a place I would love to be situated is blank because blank. So complete that sentence. Think about where you would like to be situated and if you don't remember what situated means, what can you do? Look at the yeah, look at the definition on the other page. So they already learned the word and they're keeping a personal notebook. Again, these are mostly English learners. Okay, share with your partner now. Go around and each of you read your sentence. The place I would like to, I, I would love to be situated on is on the beach because I, I would like to be swimming all day. The place I would love to be situated is in Mexico because I could see my grandma. Where is a place that you would love to be situated, Marco? <clears throat> a place that I would love to be situated is in Six Flags because it is fun to watch animals play around. Great. How many of you would love to be situated in Six Flags? Okay, that was an example again of after they've learned the word, now they're using it. They're doing that next step of active engagement with the words. Again, explicit instruction has to be reserved for those words that are high utility in cross content areas because it's so time consuming. These are again, often very abstract words and, concept, and concepts. Here are some words that again, appear in Frindle. 
we're going to take a look at a particular word. It wasn't on that list, but this is how a teacher would go about preparing. First, before the lesson, you're going to look it up in a dictionary, a useful dictionary. I happen to like Longman's because it has good student-friendly explanations. I often use vocabulary.com or learnersdictionary.com, and I choose a student-friendly explanation. Then I'm going to decide whether I need to explain a base word and other forms of the word as well. I'm going to use this structure for my student-friendly explanation. The word obedience means, and then I'm going to provide at least three examples. Uh, and um, I want to be sure that I'm using it in a way that makes sense. And I'm going to give examples such as, uh, for example, I might say, Obedience is an important quality in a pet. True or false? And ask the students to respond. Then I might say, obedience is an important quality in a friend. True or false? At this point, I'm hoping the kids are going to say false. But you never know. Some of them may want friends who are only obedient. I can also have physical response and say to the students, I want you to all show perfect obedience to my command. Stand up. Now sit down. And it is not exactly Simon says, but it is using the word obedience. Here's an example with another word. Oops. Wait a minute. There we go. Uh, one more before I get to that example. Um, usually the target word, if I'm going to ask questions, is one of the possible responses. And typically the other question is the opposite, like that example with obedience. I can ask questions that call for yes, no, or thumbs up, thumbs down. I can ask questions where kids hold up true or false cards. And I can give prompts where they brainstorm with a partner or discuss the word using sentence frames. And I could also have physical responses. So let's take a look at this example. Let's do a group response for this one. And I'm going to list some things. And if it's an example of a reliable person, you're going to say reliable. Say it. Reliable. If it's not, you're going to say not reliable. Try that. Not reliable. Okay. If someone is always late for an appointment, they are? Not reliable. Okay, good. If someone promises to bring juice for a picnic, and they do, that person is? Reliable. If someone pays back the money she owes you for a movie, that person is? Reliable. Nice. If someone forgets to bring back the CDs that he has borrowed from you, he is? Not reliable. Oh, I heard both things there. Let's listen again and think reliable or not reliable. If someone forgets to bring back the CDs that he borrowed from you, that person is? Not reliable. Not reliable. Good job. So some of those kids were giving the benefit of the doubt for their friend. Now, as an example of questions, if we're going to use questions by way, as she did, of and statements to get that engagement, that active engagement, you want questions that vary. Again, you can use sentence frames, but always you want the last question that restates the meaning of the word and may ask what word means, in which case you do that after you've already taught, say three or four words explicitly. And now you're asking which word means and you're having them go back and identify the word that they've learned. We, you saw in that class, that teacher uses signals. 
often. You saw her use of physical signals with her hand uh, when she was looking for target responses. So now we want to think about these two different types of academic vocabulary. One is the one we've been talking about, mostly tier two words. But then there are those tier three words. Those words are going to be best taught in the context of the text and subjects for which they apply. They are not those general academic words. And lucky for us, often those types of texts include explanations of these words. And often these are the words that we're teaching them about in those types of discipline specific texts. But remember, I also said a quick definition at point of use is one of our tools in our toolkit. It's recommended for those low incidence words, but that are still important to understand. To often these words are above a student's grade level. And it's not easy to be able to show an image or demonstrate them. And the key is doing this quickly so you're going to want in advance to figure out a student-friendly definition that you can use very quickly at point of use. Don't try to do it on the spot. And for a moment, I'd like you to just think, how might you explain or create a student-friendly definition for these three words? Take a moment and do that thinking for yourself. Now I'd like to have you give a shot at putting in the chat a student-friendly definition for inspire. And then Jesse will pull some of them. Glad to do it inspire to to motivate others to do what you're doing i'm seeing another one to motivate someone to do something to encourage to encourage someone to do something to get people going i'm seeing some overlap here in a lot of our definitions good thing to inspire someone to help to do their best to encourage someone to do something better or higher encourage into action very nice. Those are very nice. So now I'm going to give you some caveats about some of those. Uh, the ones that use the word motivate, I would have needed to be sure that students already knew the meaning of the word motivate, or that wouldn't be a very student-friendly definition. And using the word inspire in a sentence is critical, but not the definition, the definition of the, of the or the student friendly definition is inspire means to. So you have to explain it and then you can use a sentence. So we have to be very careful. And this is the trickiest part of asking ourselves, am I using words in my student friendly definition? that themselves may need a student-friendly definition. That is the challenge. And I will say once again, that's why I'm happy. So many of the new textbooks that have been well designed and have strong ratings do this job for us. And now we get to the big question, to pre-teach or not to pre-teach. That is the question. So here is where our two experts disagree a bit. Tim Shanahan, who believes in the importance of selecting in critical general words for pre-teaching, he says these should be those words the author does not define in text. They're not going to be the primary focus of a text interpretation discussion 
after a close read. But Elfrida Hebert actually would like students to do a first read and then use their morphological knowledge on the assumption that they've been taught morph morphology and their knowledge of word families to figure out word meaning. And we want to be sure at the same time, she says, that you have taught a corpus of important words regularly. Actually, both Tim Shanahan and Alfreda Hebert talk about that, that you still have to have taught those tier two words regularly so kids have a basis. The reality is both of them are correct. So we're going to look at some videos that actually demonstrate these two different approaches. The first one is more like what Tim Shanahan talks about. for her students, the, the words that are also essential to understanding the text. This is a hard one. It was hard for me. I kept stumbling over the pronunciation. So Ms. Soto's approach to vocabulary is multi-layered. She displays the word, oh, Everybody say taciturn. 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 gives a simple taciturn. definition, taciturn uses a related image, and provides an example taciturn. sentence. She also taciturn. encourages taciturn. the students to provide real-world examples. This helps them connect with the vocabulary more taciturn. easily and provides Ms. Soto with an opportunity for taciturn. informal assessment. Who's a taciturn student in this classroom? Who's a taciturn student? Rayhan. Rayhan. OK, anybody else? Anthony. Anthony, really? What? No. I always talk. <laughs> Maybe normally. He's doing the opposite. He's becoming quieter. Kimberly. Not all new words and Kimberly. phrases need okay, such extended up. instruction, though. Oh, Ms. Soto also incorporates right? embedded vocabulary yeah, instruction into her lesson. Yeah. One way is by providing each student with a glossary. We're going to look at the next piece of text today. It's in front of you. Just like yesterday, we're looking at one section, a paragraph. To your left, you see the text. There are some words highlighted in bold that are defined to the right. What's that called again? Words to the side or at the glossary. bottom. Glossary. You're going to need to rely on this glossary even more, I think, than you did yesterday. So as I read it out loud, I'm going to talk a little bit about the words. We learned a few. I'll talk about some of the other ones. And then when you're answering the questions with pairs afterwards, you're going to need to look back at the glossary to help you. Okay, I'm going to read from here on the smart board, but you have it in front of you. I want you to listen carefully. After I finish reading it, we'll go over our questions, and then you'll work with your pairs to answer the questions, and we'll share out. Okay, here we go. I soon discovered that if a wayfaring stranger, that means somebody who travels around. Another embedded instruction technique Ms. Soto uses sure is that while she is reading the passage, town, she'll substitute in quick definitions sure to help with the student's comprehension. A good alternative, that means another choice. Vocabulary development is an important component in any lesson plan. With ELLs, though, it takes on even more weight since they are already playing catch up and often don't have as many opportunities to develop their academic vocabulary outside the classroom. Early. And there is a drawback. A problem. After reading Even through the passage, Ms. Soto has the students night, work in pairs to answer guiding and supplementary strangers. questions about they the text. Barely talk to one another. So what I want you Okay, so now we're going to take a look at a second example that really is more aligned with what Alfreda Hebert talked about. deeper into the text and really understand what we're reading. We're going to focus on vocabulary like we always do the first time. We're going to read it by ourselves. We're going to circle those words that are tricky, words we need to talk about, words we need to clarify. We're going to circle those in what color? Pink. Pink. Also, if something stands out to you as important, can we mark it? Yeah, yeah absolutely. OK, so go ahead and get started on your first read now. I want you to talk in your groups about what words you circled. And the important part is, what do you think they mean? So remember last week we talked about context clues? Yes. Context clues are important because, I can grab another one, because they help us figure out those words that are tricky 
if we don't have something like our iPad or iPhone or a dictionary or a teacher or someone to ask. So when you look at those words that you circled, look at the words around them and see if they can give you some clues as to what the word actually means without having to go to your iPad. So our sentence frames, you're going to say which word you circled and tell what you think it means and why. What other ones did you guys figure out? I didn't really figure it. Did you get to this one? Yes, but this is kind of hard to get to. Okay, so what clues, what can we do? Are there any clues in there for spectators? Are there any word parts we could use? Yeah, what, do, what does spect mean? See if people break rules in that game. Maybe. What if, do you, have you heard the word spectacles? Like glasses? What do we use glasses for? To look. Okay, so now think of the spect might mean to look. Now look at the word again. What could that mean if you're a spectator? So like this person like looking? Someone who's looking. So let's go back and see. Women were barred not only as competitors but also as spectators. So Oh, so like watch. They can't watch it. Yeah. Okay, so write that down. That was a breakthrough. So our focus this time when we read for the second time is we're going to focus on trying to find that central idea. What is this? So uh, you saw two different examples of an approach. Neither is wrong. Both of them have advantages, and it's going to be dependent on how much the students already know. You notice in the second one, that teacher was very clear that she had already taught them how to use context clues. In the former one, that teacher had made use of a glossary, and students knew what glossaries were, so they knew how to use that. What the first teacher did, which was very useful, were really, she was doing all the parts of what Isabel Beck talks about. She had the students pronounce the word taciturn. She used a student-friendly explanation. And then she engaged the students in those words. So, Let's reiterate, when we're teaching vocabulary as part of a close reading lesson or reading complex text, we are going to pre-teach certain words. We're going to create those text-dependent questions that focus on vocabulary. We're going to encourage our students to use context clues and word parts to figure out words as they read if they've been taught how to do so. Morphological analysis is useless to help decipher a word's meaning if we haven't taught them what some of those word parts mean. So we need to be aware of that. Same with context clues. If we haven't specifically taught them how to use context clues, what those context clues might be, what signal words to look for, it's not going to be helpful. And remember, we can define words as the teacher did in the first example at point of use. But how do we decide if there are words we need to pre-teach? Well, here you are. It's what appears as a very complex decision tree. You have this in your handout. So the first question, is the word likely to be an unfamiliar general or domain specific academic word? And if the answer is no, it's not likely to be unfamiliar, then I'm probably going to decide to ignore this in terms of pre-teaching, except for perhaps my multilingual learners. But if the answer is yes, that it's likely to be unfamiliar, the next question is, is it vital to the meaning of text? 
And if the answer is no, I'm still probably going to ignore it as a pre-teaching choice. But if the answer is yes, I've got another question. Does the text define the word? And if the answer is yes, then I'm going to review it after the reading. And I'm going to often include it in a text-based question, particularly if I've taught them how to determine if a word is defined in the text. But if the answer is no, I need to ask myself, well, are there context clues? Are there prefixes, suffixes, roots that the kids already should know? And if the answer is no, I am pre-teaching that word because we already determined it was vital to the meaning of the text from earlier in this flow chart. If the answer is yes, and I've taught them about those prefixes, suffixes, roots, again, I'm gonna wait and review it until afterwards. This helps decide, do I pre-teach or not pre-teach? So we're gonna look at an actual example. I was going to have a poll, which I don't have. So I'm going to ask you instead to put your answers in the chat. This is from Pliny the Younger, which is actually a text that's been used at fifth grade and it's also been used at seventh grade. It depended on the um, history text selection. So I'm going to read it out loud. Nestled in a valley on the Italian coast just south of Naples, Pompeii had the misfortune to be situated at the foot of Mount Vesuvius. And when that volcano erupted in AD 79, it buried the city under 18 feet of ash and lava. Pliny the Younger was not with his uncle, Pliny the Elder, who died in the eruption. Instead, he observed the events from across the way and received reports from others who were with his uncle. Pliny the Younger wrote two letters to the historian Tacitus, that narrated the events surrounding the eruption of Vesuvius and the death of Pliny the Elder. So now I want you to look at three words, nestled, misfortune, and situated. And if you have your handout and you can use that flow chart, ask yourself which word would be important to pre-teach because it's important to the meaning and possibly unfamiliar to the students. And there are no prefixes or suffixes or roots that might be helpful or context clues. So go ahead and put in the chat of the three words, and I'm sorry nestled isn't in red, but among nestled, misfortune, or situated, which would you most likely want to pre-teach? Put it in the chat. So it looks like most of the folks so far are saying nestled. A couple of situated, but looks like 98% nestled. Okay. So um, nestled will definitely be unfamiliar to these students. Let me ask this question. Isn't situated the point of this particular text in the sense that where Pompeii is, is situated right at the foot of where the volcano was that erupted. Definitely they won't understand nestled, but crucial to the meaning is the fact that Pompeii is situated at the foot of Vesuvius. Nestled is descriptive that it's in a valley that all of this occurred, 
but it's where Pompeii was situated that created the overall disaster for Pompeii. It would not be wrong to do either nestled or situated, but situated is one of those tier two words, which is another reason we might want to teach it, as, whereas nestled is a rare word. It's not a word we're going to see in a lot of different contexts, but we are going to see situated. So it's a vital word for students to learn, and it's the point of how come Pompeii was destroyed. So that is a way to think about this particular one. Now, clearly eruption in the second paragraph is going to be a critical word also. It is more of a tier three word. So I might explain it with a quick explanation at the point of use. And if students understand volcanoes, that is a bit of context to help them with eruption. But I didn't give you that as a choice in making a decision. But let's look at another way to think about this with some further information. So here's the actual letter that Pliny wrote to Tacitus. My dear Tacitus, you ask me to write you something about the death of my uncle so that the account you send to posterity is as reliable as possible. I'm grateful to you for I see that his death will be remembered forever if you include it in your histories. He died in a devastation of the loveliest of lands in a memorable disaster shared by peoples and cities, but this will be a kind of eternal life for him. Although he wrote a great number of important works himself, the imperishable nature of your writings will add a great deal to a survival. Now you're seeing many of the words that were included in a couple of those videos that were taught in advance. But here was the sort that a teacher did. She identified, first of all, which words are tier two words that are gonna be words that are likely to appear in multiple contexts. One was situated, one was posterity, and one was imperishable. Then she made a decision, do I pre-teach? She decided to pre-teach situated for the reasons I discussed. She also identified posterity in that second passage as an important word to explain. And it could be explained simply at point of use, quick definition and discuss afterwards. Because the point of the histories, Tacitus history, was to be able to share the information with posterity, those who come later. And then she made use of those words that she could use context clues, in this case, morphemic analysis to help students decipher the word. And she made a decision in this case, not the teacher who did the demonstration of imperishable, but another one decided instead to have the students work with it a bit because they had learned M, they had learned able, and she did do a quick explanation that perish means to die, and then had the students work with it while they were reading. She also did that with misfortune because she had already taught the prefix miss, and this, many of the students understood fortune. Then she had an idiom that she found, weighed the dangers. That's an idiomatic expression that many students won't necessarily appreciate. And she decided to discuss this word and explain this phrase rather afterwards. That really concludes how we would take a look at all of the nuances and challenges 
of teaching vocabulary. And I, I want to be clear and summarize with this point, and that is there is no one way. In fact, you're going to have to use multiple ways. Sometimes you'll use images. Sometimes you'll use demonstrations. Sometimes you're going to do a quick point of use, a quick explanation while reading a text with the students. And especially important, there will be those important tier two words, academic words that cross content that you are gonna have to spend more time on to teach explicitly with student-friendly explanations, with putting it into context, and then actively engaging the students in using those words. So now, I would love to take some questions and there's probably way more than the time we have, but Jesse, go ahead. Excellent. And thank you before we even start. Thank you so much, Linda, for, for doing this. This is one of those presentations. We love that we can use things on Monday. And I mean, so many little gems sprinkled throughout here. And so this, I, I enjoyed this so much and the, the thank yous are starting to come in in the chat. So thank you. Uh, the first was a, was a really quick question. Uh, those cl the clips that you're showing of, uh, of the explicit vocabulary instruction, are those on, are those, can we find those somewhere on YouTube, elsewhere? Uh, well, I'm gonna stop sharing or maybe I did. Yeah, there. Um, the ones that were done with the one teacher who showed up in multiples, is those are proprietary um, clips, but I think some of them can be found on a website called wordintelligence.net. Excellent. Um, Wordintelligence.net. Ha Word intelligence happens to be an actual curriculum that when I was at CORE, we developed as a U.S. Department of Ed R&D uh, project. It was a middle school supplementary intervention for students who could decode and were relatively fluent, but lacked vocabulary and comprehension. And it uses historical text as the um, primary sources. And most of them were in fact primary source documents from world history and or US history. There were two editions. They used to be sold by my late company, corelearn.com. And you would have to contact someone at corelearn, C-O-R-E-L-E-A-R-N.com to see if word intelligence is still available as a vocabulary resource. Again, targeting middle school. The other two, the one teacher that was more like Tim Shanahan and the teacher that was more like Alfreda, I put the links on the slides and you're gonna get the PDFs of the slides. So you will be able to go to those two videos as well. Perfect, right. And there was, there was some good discussion in the chat about all of the excellent content that Anita Archer has online through her through her website, explicitinstruction.org or .com, I'm not sure which one. Uh, you'd also find a lot of her work on, on YouTube as well. Yeah, and I would add there's some other really good resources now. If you're not familiar yet with Deb Glazer's new book, Morpheme Magic, amazing for teaching morphemes. And then um, the Reading Comprehension Blueprint Nancy Hennessy's book has a whole chapter four on vocabulary. And then the Teaching Reading Source book, um, which is available at Amazon, like Nancy's book, and also at corelearn.com at the store, has a section, one section on specific word instruction, one on word learning strategies, which includes the morphemic analysis, the context clues, the dictionary use, and a chapter on word consciousness. And the vocabulary handbook is just that section pulled out of the teaching reading source book. So if those are all resources. Excellent. Excellent. And we, we are truly living through a, a renaissance period of 
PD in, in the science of reading and teaching reading. And so if folks want a little preview of things like the, the Reading Comprehension Blueprint or Dr. Glazer's Morphe Magic, you can go onto YouTube and they will have, you know, little hour overview teasers, yeah. not substitutes for reading the book, of course, but, but very good stuff. Okay, so uh, we'll kind of start from the top. I know we just have a couple of minutes here. One of the first questions that came in was about uh, how many tier two words should we be teaching per week uh, to help children keep up with academic curriculum? Is that the right way to think about it? Oh boy. <laughs> so that one is a poser. We have evidence that from research that probably in the primary grades, the most we can do is maybe three to four if we're going to teach them deeply and have multiple exposures. And you wanna be mindful that you have texts to apply them to. And um, certainly Isabel Beck talks about that. Uh, as we go up the grades, we can probably get away with five to seven that we focus on. And then when we're in middle schools, I happen to have this answer because we had to do the research as part of that US DOE study. It was a four year study in the development of word intelligence. And we had to, uh, because it was a US DOE R&D study, it required third party evaluation and randomized trials. So we tried different numbers. We started with about five a week, then we got to about seven a week, and then we actually got to as high as 10, spread over two different days in a week. So it might have been about five or six one day and the rest the next day, and then we actually got to 15. Now, how did we do that? That is so critical. The first three months, we stayed at a smaller number. The next couple months, we increased the number. And the last part of the school year, we got to that 15 in a week. Why? Because by then, they had developed enough vocabulary that they can now accelerate their vocabulary learning. If we started with a very high number to begin with, these were kids who still didn't have enough vocabulary to learn new vocabulary. So that was, we had an advisory panel that included Andy B. Miller, uh, Michael Graves, uh, Scott Baker and Claude Goldenberg, who's an expert in English learners, was the principal investigator. So it was very tricky. Wow, excellent, thank you. And so, all right, it is it is six thirty. Maybe we do we have can we have time for one more question? I'm willing. Perfect. Um, so there were a couple of questions that came in about strategies for younger students in K K two who may not be accurate and fluent enough to for for these sorts of strategies. What can you can talk a little bit about uh, primary aged vocabulary instruction in the context of read alouds and other sorts of uh, discourse? Sure, uh, it's actually not that different. Um, and in fact, in Isabel's book, you'll see that most of it is targeting primary grades at the start. So while you're simultaneously working on word recognition and fluency, you're reading aloud to the students. You're still going to do more of those student-friendly explanations that you're going to pre-teach. There will be more pre-teaching than there is with these older students. So you're gonna, again, select words, you're gonna pre-teach them, you're gonna use a student-friendly explanation, you're gonna engage the kids with those words, but a lot of it will have been done orally at the start. You still want them to see the words in writing, but they're following along with you while you're reading out loud. Um, the use of images, of course, you're gonna be able to use that with the younger students as well. As well. So that so hasn't that changed either. 
um, it will, you're going to start teaching morphology for sure. It actually starts around first grade Great. when you're doing those endings, I-N-G, E-D, et cetera. And then you're going to be doing some serious morphology work in second grade. And while you're doing that, you're going to be helping these students not only use the morphology for decoding longer words, but also for building meaning. So at the same time, you're going to be able to teach students how to make use of that. In the teaching reading source book, there are sections in every chapter called how lessons. And those how lessons are models. And you're gonna actually see examples of teaching uh, morphology and context clues to primary grade students. Excellent. Thank you so much, Linda. I, I cannot recommend that the, the, the core teaching reading source book highly enough to folks out there if you haven't. Um, if you haven't seen it or you haven't read through it, do yourself a favor and and get it. It is it is so practical. It is so applicable. Um, it actually holds the answers to many of the, the questions that we're not going to have a chance to to answer here live. Um, so it is it is 630 here. I want to make sure we're valuing everyone's time. Thank you, thank you, thank you again, Linda. I, we, I, we so appreciate you taking the time to share your expertise here with us. Um, and uh, if you have any parting messages, we can you know, go ahead and when we'll, we'll end it for tonight. All right, well, thank you everyone and thank you all for being here.